And I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, first of three oral sessions on particle acceleration, transport, and loss in the radiation belts and ring current. Uh, this session was organized by uh, Mona Kessel, David Seibeck, and myself as a as a good forum for first results of the uh, Van Allen probes. Uh, is this not working? Oh, okay. Uh, first results of the Van Allen probes, but we have a broad mix of presentations, theoretical, observational, from not only the Van Allen probes uh, mission, but from a, a mix of other uh, ob observations. We're very excited about the early results of the Van Allen probes, and we have uh, four of the principal investigators giving invited presentations on first results from that here. And we are going to start with uh, Lou Lanzarotti talking about uh, uh, Earth's ring current and radiation belt physics, and this is an invited presentation. Thank you very much, Barry. I'm glad to be here. And indeed, we will be talking about some initial results from the RB SPICE uh, instrument on the uh, Van Allen probes. I'm going to, the talk will be in sort of three parts. The first couple of slides will be discussing uh, some ring current physics, uh, bringing back some history of ring current physics. The second part will uh, the second slide or two will show how to look at some of the interpretation of our data that I will be showing, and then I'll show some initial, very preliminary uh, results from the instrument. Uh, so that's the title of the uh, there. Uh, Van Allen uh, Probe's mission uh, overview there, the science objectives you can read. There's three principal science objectives. In our instrument, and that'll apply to all of the uh, instrument papers that you will be hearing from the other th my other three collaborators on the probes, uh, the RB SPICE makes key contributions to these science questions by understanding how space weather creates the storm time ring current around the Earth and how that ring current supplies and supports the uh, creation uh, and the modulation of, ring of radiation belt particles. Our instrument here is a time of flight uh, by, eh, with energy, pulse height analysis system, and here's is a picture. I won't go into details of the, uh, of the operation of the instrument. It's in an instrument paper which is in press at the present time. This is the outline of our instrument here. There's one of the, each of these flying on each spacecraft, as you'll also hear from the other investigators. Our principal measurements are shown here. Uh, we principally are responsible for measuring uh, ring current uh, we're principally responsible here for ring current particles. We also measure electrons over approximately the same energy range. The status of our instrument status here is the energy mode is fully operational. On spacecraft A, we're measuring ions and electrons. And on spacecraft B, at this time, we're fully operational, measuring uh, electrons and, and separating hydrogen, helium, and oxygen, so some data from that as well. Uh, our data status is uh, Jerry Manweiler uh, on our team presented uh, at the GEMS presentation, gave uh, some uh, presentation on how to access and interpret our data. There's a couple of, po there are two posters here. Uh, we've missed these two posters, but I put them on here for historical content. You can go look at the abstracts for those. Uh, this is some history of ring belt physics, uh, ring current physics. These are, uh, this is data back from, this, is back, this mission is back to the future for me. We've had very few equatorial missions studying the Earth's magnetosphere. It's, equatorial missions are really interesting, really important. And this is back to the future. These are data, these are data from ATS-1. It was an equatorial, obviously, geosynchronous spacecraft showing the drift of electrons, azimuth drift around the, around, the, around the Earth in 1965. These, the drift of these particles, the importance of the ring current on these particles, uh, here's, the, here's the electron drift path here in red. The importance is, is that the uh, ring current in the plasma sphere uh, forms all kinds of wave activity, which can interact with the drifting particles, can cause them to be accelerated, lost, and uh, moved around in the Earth's magnetosphere. At the same time, here's another example uh, uh, from uh, 66 or 67 here, I can't read from this vantage point, uh, of, of particles drifting around, the, around, around, uh, around Earth, again, a geosynchronous or, orbit, and, and the ring current can modify in important ways. These are some uh, work of, uh, uh, from APL group. Some can modify in, in significant ways the, uh, the orbits of these particles by making some uh, uh, modulations in the, in the magnetic field structure, which can prevent the particles from moving around. So the ring current the ring current is very important in terms of radiation belt physics. Another example here, this is again back, back to the future. These are some data from uh, Explorer, 20, uh, Explorer 
26, is it, or 15 there? Uh, the, uh, the, insta, in, the inset, inst, instantation, on, onset of the drift mirror instability from uh, very early measurements of ring current uh, protons here, where the pressure density of the protons are equivalent to or more than the magnetic field. The beta is high, it's greater than one perhaps, and one has the onset of plasma instabilities, which can cause the acceleration of electrons in the Earth's radiation belt. Very little of this work has followed on the last 30 or 40 years. Really interesting. And now we have an opportunity with our BSP to, to explore this in much more depth and detail. And then just to summarize a lot of the ring current work that has, has been in progress and, and looking at the composition of the ring current, these are some data assembled by Nose et al. in 2005 showing uh, uh, the, the, the high hydrogen-oxygen ratios in the magnetotail, which is the long, uh, long bars here, and then individual missions, which you can see identified there. So the ring current is really important in terms of understanding radiation belt particles. And we hope and we expect with RBS, with the Van Allen probes, to get to the essence of the, some of the physics that's really driving these high energy particles, which are driving the uh, operational and design considerations for spacecraft in Earth's magnetosphere. This is how you interpret some of the data we're going to be seeing from our instrument. These are three orbits of our, these are three, uh, three orbits of our instrument. The orbit of period uh, for both spacecraft in the same orbit is about eight hours. So one, one then from, from uh, dark side to dark side here, uh, one has a complete orbit. So one can see there the inner, inner zone here uh, during the orbital pass, the outer zone, and then, then these other low energy particles here. And apogee in each of those is in this interval that you see right here. These are the way to interpret this. There are injections of electrons and ions that can occur uh, at, uh, at apogee. We're on the night side of the Earth here at the beginning. I should have mentioned that, uh, and you'll hear that from other colleagues as well. And we also see dropouts and extensions of the magnetic t magnetotail, uh, magnetic field into the magnetotail here. We can see some dropouts. So you'll see these kinds of things as we go through our data. And in fact, if we look at the energy spectrum at the time of one of these injections, one can see a peak in the energy spectrum here due to the uh, dispersion from the uh, ener from double peak and dispersion. If one does the uh, phase space density here, you may or may not get a peak. We haven't got to the physics of that as yet, but if one does, one might have a bump in tail distribution. These are the kinds of things that are really important for, for understanding the physics. Here's an example of some of our data for some uh, five days uh, here during November. This period of time has been very, very quiet. And I've been very surprised by the dynamics that one sees in a very quiet interval. We are not measuring the dynamics of the op magnetosphere appropriately for understanding these data. Measures of DST, measures of KP are not telling us what's going on on the night side during these intervals. This is one of the surprises to me uh, from looking at our data here, and one of the surprises that reminded me back of when I first started in this field back with ATS-1 and some of those early spacecraft. So one can see here these five days of data. If we look here at this interval of time uh, where the DST here uh, went down to minus 100, one can see quite dynamics in these electron distributions. This is sort of a mixture of electrons and ions, but primarily electron distributions here. There's some real dynamics. There's a decrease here, begins before DST has any measure of any activity, and then it continues. Uh, where there's a refilling of the protons here, and then there's another loss here towards the end of the interval. That's the thing to take away from here. It's really, very quiet. And this is not a, a uh, large storm as we heard about in previous talk here this morning in the previous session. If we look at this interval of DST here, uh, it's, it's, not, it's non-existent basically for any measure of magnetic activity. It's the wrong measure of what's going on to measure what's going on in the, in the, uh, in the, in the Earth's magnetosphere on night side at this time. And in fact, if one looks in detail, there's some losses here. And then there's also a little particle injection over on the third, uh, on your right there of the uh, orbit. Here, if you look at this in detail and you take a couple of slices across the, the dependence throughout this interval and in, even in, at apogee here near five, five and, five and a half Earth radii, uh, 
the energy dependencies of the ring current particles here are quite different as a function of time across this, across this interval. And this makes for very interesting particle spectra and, and calculations of the energy density. Now if we go on here to look, and, and these are examples of the spectra here in two different places here. Uh, fairly flat spectra across a wide energy range as you can see here, and down here there's sort of a peak in the energy spectra as well. We go on there to the other uh, sl slice here, one can see an ejection of protons into the uh, magnetosphere which are drifting around. Uh, we have not determined exactly where this, the origins of this drift is, whether it's on the night side or whether it's a due to an impulse on the day side. Right now it looks like this particular one may be an impulse on the day side, and I'll show you one at the end of the talk, which is definitely an increase uh, due to injection from the night side. But again, you have this dynamics going on in the magnetosphere at, at, at the equator on the night side, which is really not reflected in the normal measure of geomagnetic activity. This is just another uh, blow up of, of that uh, injection event here and this is a spectrum right at the peak of the spectrum showing the, right at the peak of the event showing the peak in the spectrum here at, uh, at 50 kilovolts, uh, somewhat less than 50 kilovolts or so of protons. This is another example of a set of data here during a very quiet interval. Uh, during a very quiet interval, this was uh, just, just before to the AGU meeting as you can see here. And there's a fair amount of dynamics. If you just concentrate on the, uh, just concentrate on the, on the uh, near uh, apogee periods here, uh, there's a lot of dynamics going on here. And KP was basically one throughout this interval, and DST didn't amount to anything. Uh, but, and, and so there's a couple of slices here at 70 kilovolts, at 250 kilovolts, showing the, showing the variability here at, uh, at, 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 uh, at the equator in these, in these fluxes. Uh, of, of, uh, of, of the protons at, at the equator at, uh, in, the, in, the right, in the ring current at the, at the ring current area around the equator. Now what we're going to do now is look at a couple of orbits here following on just prior to the AGU meeting. Oh, before we do that, here's another example of a, of a spectrum here right at the, at the edge here. You can see some evidence here of something's going on. There's an enhancement in the particle spectrum here and we'll look at that in more detail now. Uh, here, here are these two, uh, three orbits here, uh, December 1st and December 2nd. Uh, this was the beginning of the AGU meeting. Uh, these are the KP DST here was about plus 10 nanotesla, plus 10 nanotesla. KP was the order of one throughout this interval. And here one sees an ejection event uh, here in the, in, the, in the night side magnetosphere. You can see that here. There's a slice taken of the energy spectrum across here at 125 kilovolts. And there's a peak here, which uh, is evidence of this injection event. And if you take a slice here at 55 kilovolts down in here, you, you don't see much evidence of that at all. And we'll look at that in more detail now. Uh, so here's, a, here's, that, uh, here's that particular orbit blown up. You can see very distinctly here a fairly high energy, uh, don't have the energy scale on here, the fairly high energy of that injection event. And here's, the, here's that injection event in oxygen at that time here, fairly clear. Here's that injection event in helium. And there are actually two, two helium traces here, which possibly is attributed to a, uh, to a charge state uh, injection of the helium into the Earth's magnetosphere at that time, and here is that in oxygen fluxes at that particular time. So during this very quiet interval, uh, by conventional measures, there's no, no reason to expect such, such phenomena in the deep inside the magnetosphere at, at five Earth radius or so. This is inside geosynchronous. However, uh, Don, Don Mitchell pulled out the ape, excuse me, I got tied up with the cord down here, Don Mitchell pulled out the AE index, and there's a little spike at AE about, about this time, which, which uh, shows us that one really needs to go and look at the foot points of where we are on these spacecraft, and looking at the magnetic activity at the foot point at that time around the apogee region to see what, what the magnetic activity really was, that these global measures that we have are insufficient to tell us uh, anything about, uh, much about the activity that we see here. Now we go on to the other, to the other slice here. On, uh, this is uh, December 2nd, uh, and we see an enhancement of the fluxes uh, of, the, of the 
particles here. There's about 50 kilovolts or so in this region from about 40 to uh, 70 kilovolts or so. You're standing up. Uh, this is the, we, what we see here. I tell them to sit down, will you? What, what, we, what we see here uh, is a, our P, our, a very nice evidence of PC5 type, type pulsations during a, during a whole hour interval here that one can, one can see. Really very distinct, fairly periodic. What we need now is magnetic field data. What we, know, what we need are magnetic field data to understand what the energy densities of the magnetic field versus these particles are at this time, whether it's normal plasma physics, whether it's not plasma physics, whether it's some plasma instabilities. And here, here are some directional, these are our directional data. There are uh, from zero to 360 degrees uh, during this interval of the PC5 event, one can see a, uh, 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 one, one sees the, the angular distribution of the variability. There's more particles, the particles in one direction here are being enhanced uh, at one part during the oscillation and another part oppositely. We need to know the magnetic field during this time and the energy densities, as I said. Uh, and, and as an example of our, this is just, I'm going to have to go over this. This is an example of our data in distinguishing uh, uh, helium, uh, ox, uh, protons, helium, and oxygen here clearly. So we have a website here. Uh, this is the, our team's website. These are data availability here and also on our website. And before Barry clobbers me, thank you very much. A quick question or two for Lou. Oh, thank you. Okay. Fabulous job. Lou. Thank you. That's great. Okay, and next, let me announce, uh, next is Craig Kletzing, who will uh, re be reporting the electric and magnetic field instrument suite and integrated science, emphasis on the radiation belt storm probes. So what kind of you're going to dance for me? Ooh, I can do this if you okay, want. Okay, I'll just. I can do it. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I'd like to talk to you today about the electric and magnetic field instrument suite and integrated science on the Van Allen probes. Uh, you'll note that I changed the name from the abstract since we renamed uh, the mission on the uh, 9th of November. Um, we chose that name because it spells out emphasis, which is how we're always referred to. Um, a cast of characters here have contributed to this talk. Um, I just uh, call out a few of the folks on the instrument team that have been uh, really instrumental. Bill Kurth has been our waves lead. Um, Bob McDowell took over after Mario Cunha passed away for the magnetometer. Uh, Roy Torres has been the lead on our, our central data processing unit. Uh, Scott Bounds, our project manager, and George Hospodarsky, who has um, uh, steadily been validating data and looking things and keeping the data processing going. Plus, I've got folks from the ECT team helping out here and our theory team, but I'm not going to go through all the names or uh, I'll eat half the talk. So the next slide, please. Um, and that's just to point out how many people are involved. Uh, I apologize, Mike, to my RPS and uh, RB Spice colleagues. I haven't had time to include your data yet. I expect the next time I talk I'll have all five teams on here. Um, but I just wanted to thank all the folks. It's important to recognize that a mission like the Van Allen probes doesn't just happen uh, by me standing up here. There's a huge number of people involved in putting these things together, and they all deserve a hearty thanks uh, in, in getting the, these data and uh, the instruments all working, which are working spectacularly well. So the next slide, I'll start to tell you a little bit about the emphasis. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what we're actually measuring. So we're the primary wave uh, measurement on the, on the spacecraft. Um, we also provide the DC magnetometer. That data is measured at 64 vectors per second. Um, that's steady over the entire orbit, uh, no special modes. We have two different ranges, um, the uh, Earth field range, 65536, which gets us around perigee, and 4096, uh, uh, which we use primarily out uh, as we go out towards apogee. We have a more sensitive range, uh, but so far we haven't really seen a, a great need to use that. Um, these data are, are all available, and I'll give you a little bit at the very end on that. Um, it's kind of big data files, because when you get 64 vectors per second all the time, that's, uh, that's a fair amount of data. Um, on the wave side, we have um, all 3E and all 3B components from 10 hertz to 12 kilohertz. Uh, they are simultaneously uh, digitized at 35 kilosamples per second. Um, on board, we take an FFT of that data. Uh, we do the uh, 
full cross-spectral multiply complex numbers. We send down that spectral matrix once every six seconds, so there's a fantastic survey data set. We also send down waveforms, and we do onboard processing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. We also have what we call our HFR channel, which is the high-frequency receiver that goes from 10 kilohertz up to uh, 500 kilohertz, uh, and that's uh, primarily aimed at uh, uh, looking for the upper hybrid resonance so we can determine density. So one of the other very nice things we have on this mission with cross cow bedding between us and the electric field and wave uh, uh, experiment, the EFW experiment, that we're going to have plasma density pretty much everywhere on the orbit. And uh, if you want to do good physics, uh, you really got to have that. So the next side, the slide. Uh, uh, shows a nice uh, sort of um, uh, a, a plot that was put together by Wen Li uh, that shows all the different kinds of uh, wave data that we have. On the top here, this is our HFR data. And uh, um, what you can see, if you look at this, a little hard for me to outline it, but you can sort of see the upper hybrid coming down as we go out towards apogee and then coming back up with some other kinds of waves happening here. Here is uh, the electric field. Uh, this, this electric field signal comes to us from EFW, as does this one here. These two are the, uh, uh, what we call our WFR, that's the 10 hertz to 12 kilohertz, and you can see a variety of things, chorus waves in here, various other wave phenomena. Uh, and then on the bottom, what WEN has put together is taking a, a, a piece of the, of the spectra to get a power index, and the blue curves show here the, uh, the proxy for HISS, the red curves show the proxy for chorus, and what you can see is those are rather nicely delineating uh, sort of inside the plasma sphere where you expect to see hiss and outside where you're seeing the chorus. Uh, and so that's sort of a nice measure and it gives you a sense of kind of some of the kinds of things you can do when you put the data together. If we go to the next slide, this is an example of our waveform data, and so we do burst captures on board. We also send down periodic waveforms as part of the, uh, our data set as well. And this is one where we caught some, uh, some nice whistlers. Now, whistlers are nothing new, but what's kind of nice about this is it's a, you can see that they are very clear. And one of the points that I would make is this is the first time on a steady basis in the radiation belts you have 16-bit samples of both E and B. Um, so we are actually uh, audio quality here. And what that really allows us to do scientifically is get the dynamics of what these phenomena are. We can get the soft stuff as well as the loud stuff. And in the past, you often lost some of that detail in the background. And so here you see various varieties of whistler, uh, whistlers. But if we go to the next slide, I'll show you some of the onboard wave normal analysis that we've done, where here are the same two plots again. And here I'm showing the pointing vector. Uh, and what you can sort of see, it's hard for me to outline them here. You'll have to look a little for yourself. But you see. First a whistler going one way, and then you see it reflect off the ionosphere and come back the other way more dispersed. Another one starts going the other direction. It reflects, and you can actually sort of see three reflections here. I can't really point them out very well. Um, and this is just a, a very preliminary on the ground wave normal analysis that we're doing where we're getting out the pointing vector. Um, we're quite confident we can clean this up and make this even nicer. Uh, literally, I got this plot. Uh, yesterday uh, and put it in the talk. Uh, but it's a nice illustration of some of the kinds of things you can do where you're seeing these whistlers bounce back and forth and they become more and more dispersed as they go along. Now on the next slide, uh, what you can see here is a plot where I put a proxy together of the chorus power. So I've taken from 0.1 of the electron cyclotron frequency to 0.5 of the electron cyclotron frequency. And this is time along this axis, and along here we have uh, the, um, the L value that uh, these are measured at. And on top, I'm showing DST here. Actually, when put together the DST, I just I put this plot in. And what you can see is a rather nice correlation between when DST starts to drop and when the chorus takes off. So you see this storm happens here, and we get this uh, chorus that shows up uh, as it, pretty much immediately as it starts to drop. We'll have to figure out which is the, the uh, heart, cart and which is the horse. And then as DST recovers, the chorus sort of turns off. We get another little storm, a little more chorus, and another uh, much milder, actually, dip in, in DST, and yet we get a fairly amount of chorus power as well. And so this is the kind of thing that we're going to have available, and this is actually essentially uh, very similar to the space weather product that we put out, which is steadily being broadcast. So this kind of an index can be used by assimilative modelers to include into their models to do now casting and perhaps even a little bit of forecasting uh, as we go forward and understand the radiation belts better. In the next slide, uh, I show an example of taking a wave form of chorus. And so down here is the waveform. And one of the kind of nice things about having these six second waveform captures is you can play games with frequency and time resolution to pick out features that you want to get. Now uh, this uh, particular snapshot 
here, along with a few others, has gotten to be relatively famous because you can make a sound clip out of this since it's right in the human hearing range. I am going to refrain from playing it for you since I've heard it so many times. I'm starting to actually get kind of tired of it. But this just shows some of the nice things that you can do um, when you have waveforms all the time. And, you know, we uh, starting to do wave normal analysis and things like that, put the statistics together, and it's, it's really uh, an exciting uh, prospect to have so much nice data. And we're getting lots of burst data down. This is actually selected by watching that chorus power index, and then we overwrite buffers until we have a, the, the best set for a given time interval, and then we telemeter down the 19 best. And I won't discuss why it's 19 instead of 20. Um, the next slide shows a nice little postage stamp set of things. I assume all of you in the back can see that perfectly clearly. Uh, the point of this is not really to go into detail. Actually, Andre Santelic, uh, uh, who helped develop uh, what you're seeing here, uh, showed this yesterday. The point here is this is E and B on top, but what this is is wave normal analysis occurring on board the spacecraft. So this was all done upstairs and then telemetered down. And again, this is quite new. We're still verifying that this is all correct, but it looks pretty good. You can, if you look real carefully, you can see some of the chorus elements here. They show up better here once you start doing wave normal analysis and picking out things like what's the pointing vector direction. Um, but this looks really very, very promising. And what we're hoping is um, when we want to do chorus studies, what we can do when we really trust this uh, and, and are sure we're getting everything right and we're still verifying that, we can send this data set down, which is vastly smaller than the waveforms, and that means we can get a lot more of this stuff so we can get huge statistics on the propagation characteristics of chorus. So this is really just an advertisement that this is working really nicely on board and we're getting some great stuff out of this. In my next slide, uh, here what I want to show is a comparison now between the wave data and the mag ice instrument. On the top, this is RBSPA. This is RBSPB on the bottom. The top panel of each set is our wave data. The bottom panel is showing the mag ice data from a point, uh, well, it's about 20, 30 uh, keV up to about an MeV. Uh, two different sets here. Uh, this is the same time interval. And what you can see is that the waves seem to be correlated with some of this particle in, uh, uh, activity here, quite interesting particle activity. This is, again, very new. We've just started these comparisons. And it seems to be the low energy part, maybe up to 50, 60 keV that, that looks correlated with. I remind you of uh, what Joe Mazur has reminded us of, correlation is not causation. But we'll see if we can put a causal argument together. What's interesting is you're seeing the same thing down here. But when we've done some preliminary wave normal analysis that, that when Lee has looked at, this looks pretty much like these waves are hissy. These, on the other hand, look like they're polarized going perpendicular to the field. Maybe magnetosonic waves, maybe something else. Stay tuned, we'll be working on this. Next slide uh, shows an example of a comparison between um, the mag ice data and a simulation run by Richard Thorne's group, and where we saw this very rapid rise in fluxes across various different energies uh, from 8 to 9 of October. Over here is a simulation, and you might say, well, why are you showing a simulation? Well, that's because Richard takes our chorus data and is using that to drive the energization of the particles. And what's nice is, you know, we're getting pretty close to this rapid rise. Uh, not exactly as fast, but uh, this is starting to show that the models that are out there, we can start to tune and, and verify that they can do the appropriate things as we understand how we put particle or wave energy into particles. My next slide shows an example of the, the WFR, or HFR data in blown up so you can see it. And so you can really see how the uh, upper hybrid here just rings right out. And you can pick out things like the plasma pause boundary very clearly. Uh, and uh, um, the, the, uh, sort of an ongoing discussion is I learned how to do this better. Do you take inside, outside, or what part of that? But, but all through here, this is pretty much the uh, plasma frequency, and so we've got the density all the way along. And this is going to be very nice for doing uh, comparisons with models of the inner magnetosphere. Uh, in the next slide, I show an example where I've digitized off where I thought that boundary was for uh, about a month or so here. Uh, and then Jerry Goldstein has taken that with his model of the plasmosphere, and we've done a comparison here. Certainly not perfect, very preliminary. Um, we both did it independently without really a comparison of what were the criteria we were using for that boundary. But it's not a bad comparison for just blindly going in. And maybe more interesting is that the fluctuations that we're seeing as a, as a plasma pause seems to breathe in and out are roughly of the same amplitude here. And this is one of the things we'll be working on to try to uh, refine this and get the model a little bit cleaner. The next slide, though, shows if you take that plasma pause uh, data 
and you can combine that with the rept data. So this is a slide very similar to what Dan Baker showed in his very nice Van Allen lecture yesterday. And here is the rept data, again, similar format plotted in L here and time going along. And um, this is the 3.6 MeV channel. Uh, down here, what you can see is DST, and then here's solar wind velocity that drove this big uh, event that we saw from the transition of September 30th into um, October 1st. And uh, what I will call your attention to here is the red line on top, which is where I put my plasma pause boundary. And this was a surprise for me when I first started looking at this. If you'd asked me before we launched, well, you know, the energetic outer belt electrons, they always sit outside the plasma sphere, right? Well, maybe not. Here what you're seeing is that to a pretty good degree, not perfect of course, this seems to bound more the outer edge of the energetic electrons in the outer belt rather than the inner edge. And I suspect what we're seeing here is maybe a nice interplay between loss processes uh, and uh, energization processes where outside the plasma sphere, actually loss is winning. Inside, generation is winning, even though we also know that there's hiss in here, which is gradually decreasing those belts. And then, of course, you can see when the plasma sphere races in here, it just wipes out that outer belt. So some really fascinating stuff that we're already getting at this point uh, um, that uh, it, it's an embarrassment of riches, really. So just to conclude, my next slide just uh, lists off you know, all these various great things that we're doing, um, and we want you all to get involved. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's so preliminary at this point, we're just starting to look at things and really understand where we got to go to understand the physics. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's very easy to say how excited we are about this, because the data are just spectacularly good. And at the bottom here, I've listed our website emphasis.physics.uiowa.edu. Um, pretty easy to get there. There's already um, uh, quick look data that you can page through very easily. We're using uh, the auto plot uh, plotting tool, and so you can grab our data, you can combine that with uh, some of the other team's data, and uh, we really encourage you all to get involved. And, and, and as you do, please let me know that you're looking at things, because eventually we have to tell NASA we're you know, lots of people are involved. So uh, just contact us if you wanted some help with understanding data, you're thinking about looking things, at looking at things, uh, and uh, there's lots of uh, good work ahead. Thanks. A question for Craig. Yeah, go ahead. The way to do that would be to go look at the um, uh, what, what you're seeing in the in the every six second spectra. At this point, we've seen maybe only once or twice have we ever saturated the search coil. Um, it seems to be doing really, really well in terms of being in right the, the right place. Uh, we're sometimes seeing saturation in the electric field. Uh, uh, because we think many of these are due to spacecraft charging. Um, but that's the kind of thing, uh, you're not going to see a lot of that wave normal stuff immediately. That If you're interested in working on that, contact us, because that's where we want to work with you to make sure that you, know, you don't write that great paper that turns out to be an instrumental effect. One more question. Uh, we have not yet started. I, have, I feel remiss that I did not show any of the magnetic field data, but absolutely, because we've got E and B, all three vectors at low frequency. So I think we will be able to do a very nice job there. Um, it's just, you know, there's so many things to try to get done for a talk at AGU. I didn't get a chance to dig into the, the magnetic field data. Uh, but some of that in the fully processed, validated form is already now on our website from the beginning of the mission, of the prime mission. Okay, we are going to have to move on. Thank you, Craig. Uh, next is the, uh, excuse me, Inner Radiation Belt Particle Acceleration and Energy Structuring by Drift Resonance with ULF Waves During Geomagnetic Storms. And we have a switch in presenters. Martin Walt will be presenting that. Sorry, we're, uh... See, Dr. Chavod uh, sends his regrets that he couldn't be here. He had to be in Japan at the time and asked me to give his paper. So I hope this is uh, it. Yeah, that's the okay. first one, right. Um, today I want to discuss some interesting features in the spectra of trapped particles that were observed by the Demeter spacecraft. 
Uh, Demeter is a low-altitude polar orbiting spacecraft, and for today's purposes, uh, the instrument of interest is a particle detector, a uh, silicon um, detector with uh, uh, energy range of about uh, oh, 80 kilovolts up to 3 MeV. Uh, it's a very, well, it's a very high resolution detector, has about 20 kilovolts energy resolution and 128 uh, channels, energy channels, um, to look at. It also has a large solid angle, so at the low altitude it's orbiting, it can uh, see very faint fluxes and pick up particles that have been uh, diffused, transported, or whatever uh, outside the radiation belts. Now, an example of the uh, data is shown in this, uh, this first slide. Uh, the, upper, uh, the upper panel is simply uh, the L value. The second panel is the deviation of the magnetic field from a dipole. And the bottom panel is the uh, electron flux data uh, showing a pass from north to south. Uh, the energy goes from about 80 kilovolts up to an MeV. And as we proceed along here, we go through the outer belt uh, the slot, and then we see this very interesting peak here. That is now well understood. It's uh, a result of cyclotron resonance of the electrons interacting with VLF waves coming from the Northwest Cape transmitter in Australia. One sees it on virtually every pass uh, when the transmitter is on. Going further into the inner belt, one sees a series of peaks here. They're a little hard to detect uh, on this uh, slide, but there are roughly uh, six peaks uh, here. Then as you go through the equator, uh, these features repeat in the southern hemisphere. Uh, this set of uh, peaks here shows up much more clearly in the southern hemisphere where the intensity is larger due to the, to the reduced magnetic field. Then again is the Northwest Cape uh, situation. Um, it's these structures that I want to discuss uh, this morning. Uh, because they're really quite interesting. You wonder why nature produces things in such a nice, uh, organized way. Uh, can I have the next slide? Uh, this is another example going through the center of the magnetic anomaly. Uh, in, in this region, the um, Demeter spectrometer is saturated, so it doesn't see very much. But after you go out of the anomaly, then you see an, another series of peaks like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this shows the uh, spectra of a couple of those uh, examples, uh, flux in this direction and uh, energy in this direction. Uh, if you have very good eyesight, you can see individual points on these peaks. There's sort of half a dozen points on each peak, so it isn't uh, uh, just a case of data scattering. These are really well defined. Uh, one sees uh, as many as 10 of them in a pass. And uh, this shows another day, and you see the peaks are really quite different. So the peaks move around from day to day. Sometimes they're gone. Uh, sometimes they're uh, better signal to noise ratio than others. Sometimes this uh, peak to valley ratio gets as high as 10. So they're really quite interesting, and one has the feeling that nature is trying to tell us something uh, if we're just smart enough to see it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, indicates the location of the peaks. Uh, this is, of course, the, the Earth. Uh, the color coding is the normal uh, radiation belt measurements that uh, Demeter sees at uh, 200 kilovolts electron energy. And the, dot, or the dark triangles represent places where uh, more than one peak has been seen in the spectra. Uh, the white lines denote lines of constant L. These innermost ones, the lowest latitude ones, are an L of 1.7. So that uh, you see nearly all these points occur inside of L equal 1.7. Uh, the blank area here is, of course, where the detector was saturated in the anomaly and is therefore unable to detect any of them. Uh, next slide, please. This indicates the magnetic uh, activity uh, effect on, on the peaks. The uh, top panel is just DST and the bottom channel is KP. The middle channel shows the percentage of times when the satellite is in the region where peaks should occur 
the percentage of times in which it detects more than one peak. And as you see, there's a fairly good correlation between magnetic activity and uh, the uh, existence of the peaks. And in particular, where there is very little magnetic acti activity, uh, the peaks tend to disappear. So one uh, is fairly confident in associating these peaks with magnetic activities and magnetic storms. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the peaks do have a slight variation uh, in energy with L. Um, this is a blown up version of that uh, peak that was shown in the first slide. And uh, the dashed lines indicate energies at which the particles will have a drift period uh, shown, uh, I think this is 102 minutes. Uh, and this is, um, well, I can't, I can't read it, but you all can. This is 78. Uh, so uh, the peaks do seem to follow a uh, line of constant drift period. Uh, this contrasts substantially with the uh, line here, which is due to the Northwest Cape creating cyclotron resonance uh, uh, precipitation uh, of the electrons. Now these peaks are very interesting and it turns out they were first observed in uh, 1981 by Bill Imhoff. Uh, he saw a number of them. He identified the fact that uh, their variation with L coincided with a constant drift period and he speculated that they were produced by slow variations in the magnetic field which would somehow cause third invariant diffusion and move some particles down to altitudes where they could be seen by a uh, low altitude orbiting satellite. Okay, let's go on to the next one. We'll shift gears here and uh, switch to a higher, higher L value. This is L equal two to roughly three. Um, and we're to higher energies. Uh, the electrons here, or the particles here, run from uh, uh, 600 kilovolts up to about 3 MeV. Uh, and one sees here is another case of lots and lots of peaks. Uh, they radiate out from here, <laughs> apparently, and they can be seen over an interval of L, of about, L, about delta L equal one. The uh, bottom um, panel here is the uh, electric field power spectral density, and the shift from Hiss to Chorus at this point identifies this as a plasma pause crossing. And uh, so the, um, the structure seems to be associated with the plasma pause. Now in the previous uh, figures, I was just talking about electrons. Here we believe these are protons, uh, low energy protons, which uh, also are producing uh, these very interesting structures. Uh, next slide. This is another example the bottom panel here is the uh, cold plasma density, and uh, this would identify the plasma pause. And again, the uh, uh, peaks seem to originate at the plasma, plasma pause and uh, uh, continue downward or uh, equatorward from the plasma pause. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's another example. So go, let's go on to the next one. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a, um, a measure of the variation of those peak energies with L. Uh, the solid lines are taken off the uh, experimental data, shows how the observed uh, energy of the peak varies with L. The dashed lines are uh, calculated values of uh, how energy would vary with L to maintain a constant drift period. And you can see the agreement is quite good, uh, suggesting indeed that uh, uh, the drift period is an important parameter in this uh, uh, phenomena. I'll uh, go to the next slide. Uh, this shows where they occur. Uh, this, all this is uh, from the previous um, slide on the low uh, L value electron fluxes. This is the uh, collection of occurrences of more than one peak in uh, uh, the, the proton spectra. And as one can see, they all occur within about um, this line, which is, uh, um, ooh, I think it's um, a 3.5, uh, an eloqu uh, 3.5. Again, we can't say much of what happens in here because the detector is saturated uh, in that region. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this shows the um, variation with um, 
magnetic activity, again, uh, DST at the top panel, KP at the bottom panel, and this the occurrence percentage of the, um, um, uh, the peaks in the proton spectra. Again, you see there's a good correlation with um, KP, which would uh, in, argue again that these are produced by magnetic activity uh, affecting the, elect uh, the, the protons. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's skip this one and go on. Okay. Um, in interpreting this data, um, we are inclined to believe that uh, this results from a drift, um, drift resonance uh, drift resonance between the particles and ULF waves. Uh, the reason for this is, of course, the fact that as these particle uh, peaks appear, they have the same drift period uh, regardless of the L value at which they're observed. As a result, we have tended to look for waves, ULF waves, uh, at the times when uh, these peaks occur. The idea being that if you have lots of ULF waves and if you have a number of M values, uh, that is azimuthal wave numbers, you would get a different peak for an each, uh, wa each azimuthal wave number, and that would explain the fact that you get multiple peaks. Uh, this is some data, ULF data, obtained uh, just before the uh, phenomena shown in the, my first slide, uh, which um, the first slide showed data taken at about this point, and so one sees fairly strong wave activity uh, here. And if you blow up that section, uh, incidentally, these are ground-based uh, measurements. Uh, uh, the CLF is a French station. Um, uh, this one, Pine Ridge, is a, a U.S. station. So one sees that these uh, ULF waves have almost sinusoidal characteristics and are global in character, being seen roughly the same amplitude in France and uh, the United States. Uh, so let's have the next slide. Okay, so what we have done is create a simulation in which we created an idealized ULF wave, which was a poloidal wave um, with a frequency, uh, with a period actually, of a, a thousand seconds. Uh, it had an azimuthal uh, electric field value of four milli, uh, millivolts per meter. And then we allowed the... Uh, radiation belt particles to experience this wave for uh, 20 minutes. The net result is that we see this for the uh, electron flux. Um, these are particles that have been brought out of the radiation belt down to altitudes where Demeter can see them. They create these peaks which also line up with the dashed line, which is the uh, a line of constant drift uh, period. So this uh, indicates that um, uh, ULF waves, more or less uh, constant frequency, but with a varying, uh, varying set of M values. The M values of this wave incidentally varied from one to six. So one, in that case, one gets six, um, uh, uh, six different peaks. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, let, then I'll go on to the next one. This is a, sim, a similar s simulation run for the uh, proton distribution. And uh, in this case, M went from 4 to 19, and so one sees a much larger number of peaks. But um, again, the uh, lineup with uh, constant drift period uh, is very good, and the general characteristics uh, look reasonable. So we feel this is a very viable uh, explanation of this quite interesting phenomena. As far as we know, nobody has noticed these proton peaks before, although, as I said, the uh, electron peaks were, no were discovered back in 1981. Uh, thank you. Great. A quick question for Martin? Dan. No, uh, that's an extremely good question. Uh, the, elect oh, the identification of protons and electrons is based largely upon which regions in space electrons and protons dominate. Although we also have a point on the uh, proton spectra, 
Um, we know that the detector is pretty thin, and electrons of a couple of MeV will run right through it and uh, won't leave a 2 MeV pulse. So we believe then the, those are really protons. Okay, well, thank you very much. We will have to move on. And I know uh, next uh, talk is first results from the radiation belt storm probes, uh, energetic particle composition and thermal plasma suite science investigation by Harlan Spence. And I know he's going to make up some time for us. Uh, I, either way, uh, you can click. Okay, good. Good. Well, he can do it here too. So thank you, uh, Barry, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's very hard for me to see the screen up here, so I'll do the best I can with the pointer. Um, it's really my delight to be presenting first results, as uh, we've heard earlier from Lou and Craig, from the ECT uh, in instrument suite, uh, which is part of the uh, thing formerly known as RBSP, now Van Allen Probes Mission. Um, that's one name of the title. The other is How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love the Radiation Belts. It's, uh, I think, as Dan Baker uh, showed last night at the uh, Van Allen Lecture, this has been a long process and lots of uh, trials and tribulations along the way. Um, my hair is starting to grow back. It's growing back uh, not gray, but blonde. So we're very happy to be uh, presenting first results, and they look absolutely remarkable. So we're very happy uh, with the outcome. Uh, I borrowed Craig's slide, and in this particular talk, you'll be seeing uh, measurements from two other instrument uh, packages on the spacecraft. So I've included the long list of people here who've contributed. Uh, we very much look forward to working with Lou and with uh, Joe Mazur on RPS that you'll hear about later uh, in terms of complementary studies. But uh, for this particular talk, it'll be primarily the ECT team that you can see up there along with uh, supporting measurements from the WAVES and FIELDS uh, experiment. So just quickly, ECT is a, a comprehensive, coordinated, collaborative, and integrated uh, set of instruments that range from the low energy, this is just a schematic showing uh, flux across many orders of magnitude at, from the lowest energies uh, down in the EV range uh, up to tens of keV, where a second instrument, and that is an instrument uh, called HOPE, Helium, Oxygen, Protons, and Electrons, uh, led by Herb Funston at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, in the intermediate uh, range, where you really start getting into the ring current and uh, core of the radiation belt particles, uh, is a second instrument. At, there's actually four uh, instrument boxes per spacecraft, and that's called the Magnetic Electron Ion Spectrometer, MAGICE. Uh, Bernard Blake at the Aerospace Corporation is the lead of that instrument. And then finally, the highest energies up into the relativistic and ultra-relativistic range is the Relativistic Electron and Proton Telescope led by uh, Dan Baker, and we heard quite a bit about that last night at, uh, at Dan's um, really outstanding Val Allen lecture talk. So collectively, we uh, cross a very broad energy range with sufficient energy resolution, pitch angle information to be able to tackle the science questions fa uh, facing us. These are the uh, baby pictures of the, the instruments. Here's HOPE. Uh, here's one of the four types of MAGICE instruments and the REP instrument shown here. I can just simply uh, report that uh, we uh, at delivery had very capable instruments and they are meeting or exceeding those ground test uh, uh, types of uh, testing we did before launch in space and uh, uh, with excellent background rejection. That's a huge thing for us to be able to separate the foreground particles that we're going after and uh, separate them from the, the background, the penetrating radiation background. So let me uh, give you a little bit of time history here. This is a, a, a brief uh, history of time, and it, as you'll see, is stormy. This is a time period going from August 30th up to basically last week, just a few days ago. Um, this is a, as you'll see, uh, unfolding here. This, we're going to be looking at a particular energy channel from the REPT instrument as a function of time and sorted by L at the top and then supporting um, parameters below, uh, geophysical parameters below. So we launched on 8.30. Uh, shortly thereafter, the REPT instruments turned on, and as we heard from Dan last night, that was uh, sped up owing to the demise of, uh, or the impending demise of the SAMPEX uh, mission. We wanted to have some overlap. And so the uh, REPT instruments came on and started uh, returning really outstanding measurements, and we saw as a function of L this uh, very uh, much expected sort of pattern of an outer zone electron population and an inner zone with a slot region in between, sort of the textbook uh, sort of picture. 
Shortly thereafter, we had a, a first of, a, of, an, of an event that created um, a very dynamic outer zone population that uh, we heard quite a bit from uh, Dan about that last night. I'll show a little bit later. Shortly thereafter, mag ice came on day eight, um, and it came on during the uh, sort of period shown here where there were, again, dynamics in the outer zone electrons. These are the two and a quarter MeV electrons, by the way. You can see solar wind speed here. Uh, this is IMFBZ, and this is the uh, DST component. So I'll uh, click one more time here and, and just uh, point out that at this point, mag ice was uh, in a configuration that was in a more of a science mode. Of course, this is all during commissioning. So the red bar here shows the period of commissioning, uh, and the green is phase E. So hope uh, A and B turned on here at a period of uh, uh, relative quiet, but shortly thereafter we had another uh, major set of uh, storms here that really lit, out, lit up the outer zone. Uh, so as each instrument came on, it, it was uh, able to experience these sort of uh, ch uh, dramatic changes. The HOPE instrument uh, was not commissioned until uh, finalized uh, its operational modes until just before the end of commissioning. It was the last one on. Phase E started here, and you can see during Phase E we've now had a, a number of other major events. So we've just been absolutely blessed, as uh, Dan pointed out last night. The sun has uh, really given us some fantastic opportunities for some early science. I'm going to try to show you uh, some slides here that show uh, the capability of the instrument, where we are, and some early science results. So let me start with HOPE. Uh, this is a, a, a image that shows uh, time of flight. HOPE is an electrostatic analyzer. Um, top hat configuration with a time of flight uh, back end. And so uh, this just shows, as a function of energy, the time of flight uh, uh, spectrogram uh, showing the separation of the oxygen, the helium, and the protons. Uh, so uh, things are working very, very well with very clean background uh, 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 separation. And uh, the, the particular design is really, really working extremely well. We're very we're pleased. The kinds of science we're doing with that is illustrated in this uh, panel here, which shows, unfortunately, it doesn't quite spell hope. It's H-E-P-H-O-E, -E, so it's not quite hope in the order there. But anyway, hydrogen at top, protons, helium, oxygen, and the electrons at the bottom shown as a function of L. And if you look carefully here, you'll see these periods of uh, where the fluxes drop dramatically. That's not an instrumental effect. These are uh, periodic uh, encounters with the, uh, with the lobe, so even at these very low L shells. Uh, and this has been seen in previous missions, and uh, particularly uh, a good body of work at geosynchronous orbit, and also by uh, Kress and Scath, I should add. Um, these are observed during uh, storm times, and uh, what we're able to do, I'm only showing one spacecraft here, but with two spacecraft measuring simultaneously at two different locations, we're able to really separate the space and time aspects of these lobe encounters. So that's something uh, that uh, we'll be looking at carefully. Uh, what I'm showing here is a composite of uh, the four MAGICE instruments that, that are on each spacecraft. And uh, despite the fact that we have four boxes, and when you stitch them together, uh, they cover seamlessly energy spectra from uh, tens of keV up to several MeV. Uh, what you're looking at here is several days' worth with um, uh, apogee and perigee passes uh, seen sub subsequently here. Uh, and this was from a period, two-day period in, uh, in October that's one of interest here. Uh, if you, as I think you saw in Lou Lanzarotti's presentation, the uh, outer magnetosphere, outer zone, is just rich with dynamics and structure, and we see features that go from seed populations right up to the relativistic energies. And uh, I think a point that a lot of us will be coming back to over and over again, the fact that we have two matched units, one on one spacecraft, one on the other, is allowing us to do two-point measurements uh, to separate space and time like never before. It really is. We all feel like the, you know, the kid who got the birthday gift, and it looks like a small box, and you open it, and there's gifts that just keep coming out. It's, it's kind of overwhelming, but also just very gratifying. So uh, a follow-on to Martin's talk, this is uh, a really fantastic capability of the MAGICE instrument. So what you're looking at here are outer zone uh, electrons and, uh, that have this ULF wave uh, modulation going on. Uh, down in the bottom here, what, what you're looking at are several different energy channels, and, and a point uh, to make is that if uh, the main 
data that comes out of the instrument is an integration essentially across uh, this, this uh, vertical axis, which is energy. So these are uh, in, in, uh, channel numbers here uh, across a uh, relatively broad energy range. But we have a, what's called a histogram mode that allows us to go in and at particular energies from uh, tens of keV or hundreds of keV up to ha roughly half an MeV to get 10 keV resolution within that band. And you can see these really remarkable, coherent structures uh, before and after a perigee pass here that are um, really quite dramatic. There's a lot more information. We have pitch angle information uh, in addition to two spacecraft. And uh, I believe these kinds of measurements are going to really open our eyes as to what's going on. We simply couldn't see these things before because we didn't have the resolution. Uh, let me give an example uh, again from Mag Ice of the protons. So we're really looking now at a, a collection of things uh, during a period when this very interesting period where we had two storms in close succession. The first storm was what we call a double dip, so you can see a, a double feature there in the DST. The top panel, and these are L sorts as a function of time, in this case of the 63 keV uh, protons measured by Magis. You can see clearly this uh, double injection associated with these two storms. These are the part of the pressure bearing population that as uh, RB Spice is really uh, its main focus. We're complementary here with, uh, with the protons here, so you can see the uh, intensification of those populations that are leading to the DST, which is seen down here. At higher energies, at half an MeV, you can see that there's a hint of uh, variability there. These are really outside the core of the ring current energy population, and at much higher energy, 1.3 MeV, you can see that they're more or less unaffected by uh, what's going on in the outer part of the magnetosphere. So just an example to show that across a broad energy range, we're really able to unfold the different populations and how they're responding. Uh, this is a, uh, a very busy slide, but I'm, I'm grateful Dan spent a lot of time on it last night in his lecture. And uh, it really is quite remarkable, as I think Lou pointed out, the structures and dynamics that we've seen so uh, early on it, are really quite remarkable. Uh, this is an L sort as a function of time of the uh, electrons from the rept instrument, again showing uh, the uh, solar wind speed, the interplanetary magnetic field, and the DST, and uh, superposed on this, uh, again, it's, it's a version of what Craig showed earlier of the uh, plasma pause location. So some mysteries coming from, from there. I would say uh, just uh, quickly that we have begun some theoretical analysis. This is some work by Richard Thorne that uh, shows that that decay of the so-called storage ring uh, predicted by theoretical models is roughly consistent with what we're seeing. So. I think as Craig said, with the um, capabilities we have with having particles and fields together, we're really able to get at the heart of the physics. Uh, Dan has showed this one, again, that shows the evolution of the, uh, the sort of remarkable belt reconfigurations during this period. This is a movie that shows three days at a time, uh, three orbits, uh, three days at a time, and, and e these are snapshots at those three days. So you can, I think your mind's eye uh, can easily fill in what's going on here with uh, really quite impressive changes in the outer zone over the course of this uh, early interval. Uh, Craig has already shown that, so I'm not going to dwell on that other than to say that uh, this is a very early estimate of the phase-based density. And I'll point out, um, if you stay around, and you should, it's worth missing the beer this afternoon. Trust me, seriously. Come back at 4 p.m. Jeffries has a talk where we have uh, the next generation of phase-based density calculations with some really quite exciting results. Uh, Dan showed the inner belt protons that we're able to visualize quite dramatically, and uh, Joe Fennell, showed uh, the electrons in the uh, slot region and the inner zone. These are new kinds of measurements we've never had before. They're discoveries just by sh looking at this figure. We've never really had the ability to uh, cleanly separate out what's going on in these populations. So uh, in a nutshell, we have uh, all of our instruments are really uh, operating as we planned, and the uh, system is, is behaving better than we could have uh, expected, great background rejection technique. Uh, things are going very, very well. We have, uh, I think,
think as you've seen a, a, a number of presentations here, some of them have, have already occurred, some of them are about to occur. Uh, and we really encourage, as I think Craig said, a collaborative type study. So I'd recommend uh, visiting our websites here, which I'll sort of leave up. And if there are time for questions, I'm happy to, to take them. Thank you. Quick question for Harlan. Maybe a quick question for Harlan. Okay, they're overwhelmed. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'll let you do that if you, uh, if you can. Uh, next uh, presentation is a simulation study of particle acceleration, transport, and loss in the radiation belts and ring current. Uh, Meixing Falk was going to present it, but it will be presented by. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name. I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, good uh, good morning. My name is Natasha Buzelukova, and I will sh I will present this talk instead Machin. So the actually the main purpose of this presentation just to show you the new model uh, we just uh, recently developed, and uh, we hope this model will be very useful tool in analyzing new data from RBSP. So uh, this is so-called uh, SIMI model. It combines two very uh, well uh, old uh, models of Meitin. The first model is CRCM, and the second model is RBE. The first model usually is CRCM is usually used for uh, wind current ions, and uh, RBE is usually used for radiation belt electrons. So now we decided just to combine them and see uh, what new physical uh, uh, effects we may put into this combined model. So as a uh, um, uh, normal uh, RBE, um, SIMI will have output for uh, electron, uh, for en energetic electrons, and as normal CRCM, SIMI will have output for in current ions, uh, both protons and O plus ions, and uh, we will have also field aligned uh, current distribution, electric field potential, plasma sphere model inside SIMI. But in addition, it's something new we want to show you. We are going to, we will be able to calculate uh, diffuse aural precipitations from electrons and uh, uh, also putting uh, feedback from precipitation to conductances. We'll uh, be able to describe. Uh, um, uh, diffuse aurora, uh, electron diffuse aurora, and quick changes in precipitations and conductances associated with precipitations from electrons. Okay, so, and when we've started to do that, we realized that um, we have too much, too much electrons, and the reason is um, we, in, in the SIMI, we want to consider uh, electrons in the range from uh, 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 1. 0.1 kV to uh, several uh, hundreds uh, kV. So, um, uh, sorry, from 1 uh, kV to several, um, several MAV. So, in the range between 1 kV and 10 kV, we found that the old model of waves is, uh, doesn't, doesn't work very well. And we need to include additional wave, namely we need to include upper band cores. And the reason is that recent studies showed that uh, upper band cores is critical for um, our role precipitation, for diffuse our role precipitations. And we've used a recently published model, both upper band and low band uh, cores modes, and uh, we will be a we were able to describe the precipitation of electrons uh, uh, with good uh, accuracy, we believe. And as an example, we will show you the one simulation study. It was very well space weather event, so-called Galaxy 15 storm, named after, after failure of a Galaxy 15 satellite. And uh, th that was, uh, that occurred during high substorm activity uh, at the April 5th. And, but, but in jail, it was very really mild storm with DST about mi minus 60. And I will show just two 
to example of comparison between data and CIMI, it will be Kibono for electron, for energetic electrons and the ENA data, energetic neutral item data for in current ions. And this is comparison between Ekebona and Simi. And uh, uh, we think uh, Simi is doing pretty well, uh, but we cannot describe actually uh, maybe very good initial population, but uh, we, we are working on that. And the comparison between even current and semi actually is very, very good too. So uh, during late recovery, we've sampled ENA from two twins uh, spacecrafts and were able to describe these uh, ENA emissions pretty well with this new semi model too. And uh, uh, this is a mo movie showing highly dynamic structure of um, overall, uh, diffuse overall precipitation during this storm. And also we found that um, total, total amount of energy deposited into um, in the during this storm was very well compared with some published empirical models. So we are pretty sure we, just, we are doing a pretty good job here. And after that, we were able to calculate conductances from our precipitations. And this is comparison between published Hadji model and our uh, new SIMI model. This is I think Pedersen and Hull conductance. I think agreement is pretty good, uh, both in terms of spatial distribution and in terms of magnitude. Please pay attention that color scale is different here and here, but the same for models. So actually Pedersen conductance is much, much lower than, okay, lower than uh, Hull conductance, and this feature is also captured in our model. So uh, actually that's all, and uh, I just want to mention several important things. Uh, we believe that feedback from conductances will be extremely important for the uh, in current model. Uh, we already have a hardy model uh, which comes from precipitations, but our model will be highly dynamic. It means we have highly dynamic precipitations, highly dynamic conductance, and hence uh, highly dynamic electric field. And these enhanced uh, fluctuations in electric field may also cause enhanced diffusion of radiation belt, both of radiation belt and the current particles. And we are going to study this effect um, in the nearest future. And we also uh, uh, we also plan to include this model uh, in uh, MHD model Batsaras. In this case, we will be able to capture effects of self-consistent uh, magnetic field. Uh, we have we already have established two-way coupling between our model between CRCM and uh, uh, Batsaras. Two papers will be uh, will be submitted for public for DGR very soon. So it will be not too difficult to to implement these new features. Uh, into two-way coupling. So we have, we believe we have a good uh, tool to study radiation belt dynamics and hope to help uh, with the new RBSP mission. That's all, thank you. Any questions on this paper? Okay, well thank you very much. Okay, the next paper is multipoint measurement of anisotropic electrons, Whistler waves, and radi radiation belt electrons by Liz McDonald. Hi, good morning. I'm very excited today to uh, present some more uh, Van Allen probe data uh, featuring both the wave, uh, waves and the particles, especially my favorite particle instrument, HOPE, the plasma mass spectrometer at low energies. Um, so, uh, and there's a, a large team um, that's responsible for, for all of this, and I'd like to especially thank the engineers and the people who've been involved with the processing chain for the data for um, getting us to this point today. Okay, so what I'll be talking about, an introduction to HOPE, um, briefly, and some of our observations during uh, the two storms that we've seen in November, um, after we turned on in mid-October. Okay. So uh, the HOPE instrument measures, um, as has been mentioned, uh, ion composition and um, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, and electrons from uh, about 1 eV to 50 keV um, in five polar angles uh, with 
10 CEMs to measure the start and stop um, and the time of flight of the ions. We have uh, 16 azimuthal sectors as the spacecraft spin to um, capture, capture all the uh, variations with respect to the magnetic field. The spin is about 12 seconds and um, some of the basic parameters on the instrument, it's about yay big and um, quite heavy and um, uh, takes um, 18 watts of power. And there's a rough picture there. This is our first time of flight spectrogram that we saw um, uh, around uh, mid-October. The uh, energy sweep is on the um, x-axis here and the high energies are in the center here as we um, uh, step through all the energies. So that's why you see slightly um, lower time of flight for this hydrogen um, at the um, highest energy. And we were uh, commissioning the instrument. We saw this. Um, we were working pretty long hours. And uh, what happened next was pretty revolutionary. Um, the next uh, slide shows you what we saw. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, we also thought of a new unofficial sponsor. We could be sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts. Um, but uh, overall, the, com the commissioning was very successful. And now I'll show you some of the real data. Um, so I will be focusing on two days, November 1st and November 14th, which are um, basically the main phase and the very early recovery phase of these two CME-driven uh, storms in November. And all of the plots have all the disclaimers at the top um, to emphasize that these really are very preliminary data. Um, but what I'm showing you here for spacecraft B, um, the uh, flux spectrograms for the um, three ion species, and then the electrons. Um, you see a couple of nine-hour orbits here for the spacecraft. Um, currently, we're operating uh, with a slightly higher than nominal um, minimum energy of 25 EV, but we expect to drop that um, relatively soon. And on this day, uh, of November 1st, we saw um, a couple of uh, stronger spacecraft charging times, um, both on the, the orbit in the middle of the day and the second one. Um, next, I am pleased to show you the waves that correspond to um, this time frame in this middle orbit. And um, I'll be focusing on um, their Whistler mode waves and how they correspond to um, the electrons that we observe, uh, which look like this in, in the flux, flux spectrograms. And uh, this, before I do that, um, this is the other spacecraft. And it shows similar results, similar spacecraft charging. Um, uh, and um, we can really start to look at the space-time effects with the two spacecraft, which are quite close together, um, in early November for these storms. So here, um, I also got plots um, pretty late. Bill Kurth very kindly gave me some plots from his poster. Um, that show very nicely um, the emphasis and EFW spectrograms for this day, um, where uh, these are the Whistler waves at half the um, electron cyclotron frequency. You can see both upper and lower band, and uh, uh, the, both the electric and magnetic components. Uh, the next um, slide shows the similar plot for the other spacecraft. Um, and on this day during the main phase here, we saw uh, quite a lot of Whistler waves for several hours. Uh, we are in a magnetic local time at Apogee around uh, dawn here. So this is um, just the ideal time to be seeing Whistler waves um, during this activity. And the previous plots were the survey plots, where you can't see the individual chorus elements. Um, but this is one of the um, uh, waveform captures that shows chorus, really beautiful capture of chorus elements uh, at um, about 10 o'clock uh, during the middle of that middle pass. Um, you see the gap, and you see the upper band and the lower band. And along with that, um, so that, this is the whole day again, and this is a combined preliminary spectrogram from all of the ECT 
observations. Um, the HOPE uh, instruments on the bottom here at the low energies, and then MAGICE, and then REPT. Um, so you can really see uh, this is spacecraft B first, I believe. And um, so the chorus waves were observed um, coincident with these electrons. Um, and you can see some, some hints of the acceleration in, um, the higher, at the higher energies as well. So I just wanted to show some examples of um, what, what we've seen so far. And, and all of this needs, needs more work. But uh, just so you can see what, what these plots are looking like. The next um, one shows the second spacecraft. And if you focus um, right here, this is one of the injections. There's a couple of um, substorm injections, which uh, Jeff Reeves will be talking more about in his talk tomorrow morning. Um, but if you focus right here, and um, if Mona would be so kind as to go back and forth a little bit, uh, you will see that we see the same injection on both spacecraft at the same time. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what I want. <laughs> um, so, and then you also see, if you're um, really sharp here, you can see some of the um, hints of injections that are not seen at the same time on both spacecraft. So just a very preliminary look at the spatial and temporal changes. Um, next, I'll quickly show a second event that uh, is November 14th. Um, the DST minimum was around minus, na minus 100 nanoteslas. Um, around here and then started to recover gradually in this second orbit. Um, this is the day that Harlan showed earlier, um, and Ruth Skog has been looking at the lobe crossings that we saw in the first orbit, um, where we saw four lobe crossings um, for the both spacecraft at slightly different times, and so there's some interesting, um, interesting uh, tests of the mapping that I think we can do there. And then in this middle orbit, um, again, we see a lot of Whistler waves, and we see these uh, electrons, uh, plasma sheet electrons, um, fairly low energy. So the next, yeah, this, this slide shows a um, attempt to show both, um, both spacecraft and some of the waves and some of the electrons at the same time. So um, just as an example of what, what you can do with Autoplot, you can open this up and zoom in and out on these. And um, so far, it's, it's uh, working pretty well. So um, next, OK, so next what I did um, was we don't have uh, the magnetic field direction um, to see what's field aligned and what's perpendicular in the HOPE data yet. Um, we're working on that. But the electron spectrogram for a close-up of that time frame, um, a few minutes around 10 o'clock on November 14th here, is shown at the top. And then uh, the bigger panel here shows um, the sector uh, on the y-axis, the 16 sectors of these um, as the spacecraft spins in, um, in the belly band detector as a function of time. And so what you should see for stripes, individual stripes, are two peaks and two valleys when you have some anisotropy um, in, in the, at this time. And so we do know that there's, there is um, Whistler activity at this time. And we do see all of these for quite a range of energies have um, two peaks and two valleys. And you can see some fluctuations and get stronger. And, um, this is just a, a start at looking at that. So next, I wanted to show um, at this time as well, we have um, both the spacecraft are um, right over uh, Saskatoon, Canada, roughly, um, large area here. And um, the all-sky camera was quite clear from that day. Eric Donovan provided this video. Um, it's very active. Maybe you can go to the middle. Maybe I can do it. So I'll speed it up a little. So you'll see a bunch of pulsating aurora around 10 AM, which is when the RBSP spacecraft um, are overhead. And um, yeah, it's coming up now. North is at the top of this um, all-sky camera color view. 
I think it's a six second integration. Um, so you can't pick out all of the pulsating Aurora features, but you can definitely see that there's quite a strong display of pulsating Aurora here. Um, and uh, just a preliminary look at, at this at the same time as both spacecraft are seeing uh, a lot of Whistler activity um, during the very early recovery phase of that, that storm. And also I wanted to point out that the earlier orbit is over here over uh, Scandinavia roughly and if anybody has any ground-based observations of um, polar cap boundaries there we'd be interested, very interested in talking to you about that. Um, okay, so that's pretty much the end. Dawn. Um, next, uh, one brief preview here, 13 second preview of what we're going to do with this. Um, so when we, um, we want to do observational tests of the waves and the particles. Um, so we can look at the, the particles and apply some um, linear theory, uh, which um, Peter Gary and um, some of us at Los Alamos have looked at for previous geo observations and seen how um, test how the particles uh, will be, whether they're, how they're growing and scattering and um, getting energy from the waves. So we will be able to look in much more detail at this um, with the Van Allen probes observations and also apply these sorts of tests to other wave modes as well, um, including magnetosonic and uh, EMIC mode. So if you go two more slides. So um, the next, uh, what we are doing next, um, we're going to be lowering the energy limits on the HOPE instruments so that we can measure all the plasma spheric ions, hopefully, um, working hard on calculating pitch angles and moments and um, some initial cuts at composition. Um, as I mentioned, testing the wave particle interactions, the Van Allen probes We'll have um, upcoming conjunctions over um, Canadian all-sky cameras and other instrumentation over the next a couple months. And uh, plug my website here for EPO if anyone wants to see the aurora. And uh, I already mentioned this. That's Ruth to talk to. And the last slide um, attempts to thank all the people that um, have contributed. And I don't have the names for all the other instrument teams, but I would like to thank all of them as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Quick question for Liz. Any mm -hmm. questions out there? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, next presentation is effect although, although I would like to say that it is Van Allen probes, not VAP. I don't like VAP. Van Allen probes sounds so much better. Effect of MLT-dependent electron loss rate on the inner magnetospheric electrodynamics and plasma sheet penetration to the ring current regions by Matina Jolido. Okay. Oops. Uh, can we go on the you, first slide? You can push it yourself. Is this the first slide? No, no. Oh, it's uh, This one, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Martina Gulidu. Uh, Barry has been avoiding pronouncing my last name <laughs> the last six months I am at APL. Uh, but I'll be presenting here uh, a work that I did, uh, the very last part of my dissertation, pretty much, that I completed at UCLA. And the title is long, but uh, I'm very happy I actually, my talk is right after Natasha's and uh, Lizzie's talk because I'll be talking about how the thermal population of electrons and uh, the precipitation of this uh, population to the ionosphere can actually affect the penetration of the plasma sheet into the ring current region. So why are we interested? Uh, as I said, when this uh, thermal population of electrons precipitate in ionosphere, they will enhance ionospheric conductivity, which is key to inner magnetosphere electrodynamics. So the goal of this study was to investigate how different electron precipitation rates affect the electron distribution in the inner magnetosphere to begin with, then how they will affect the MLT distribution of electron precipitation precipitating energy fluxes, 
how this in turn will affect the conductivities in ionosphere and as a result the shielding of the convection electric field and the ion penetration into the ring current region. Um, how we are proceeding with this study, I'm using the, we are using the rice convection model. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the scheme of, of rice convection model. Basically calculates bounce average drift of isotropic distributions of uh, protons and electrons. Uh, very important, it includes self-consistent electric field, which means it has the magnetosphere-ionosphere coupling physics uh, through the connection with the field-aligned currents. And this version also has self-consistent magnetic um, field model. We have coupled RCM with a modified DAGI force balance magnetic field solver. And uh, in the end, we compare our results with the statistical DMSP precipitating electron fluxes. Um, one key thing, as I said, uh, for this study is the conductivities. We use the Robinson and Tal formula. And you can see that the conductivities are a function of both uh, average energies and energy fluxes of these precipitating electrons. So briefly, the run setup. Uh, I'm running RCM for five hours under quiet time, 40 kilovolts uh, potential drop. And then I gradually increase the potential drop from um, uh, 40 to 60 kilovolts uh, within two hours. Um, the plasma boundary conditions, we are using substorm growth phase um, uh, data, statistical data from Geotail and uh, Themis. Um, basically, I'm not going to go into great detail of the boundary conditions, but both the plasma boundary conditions and the um, uh, convection enhancement is trying to simulate as closely as possible a growth phase-like convection. And the reason to do that is because, as I said, we want to compare our results with DMSP observations, and we want to focus on uh, growth phase intervals without any expansion phases due to the limitation of our model. As plasma initial conditions, we use a previous RCM uh, run by Wang et al. in 2011. And the key factor that we are playing with in these runs is we use different electron loss rates and see how this affects the MI coupling process. So the first rate we use is the Chen and Schultz uh, model, 1994, MLT-dependent uh, electron loss rate according to wave activity. You can see the... Uh, formula right here, so it has a maximum at uh, 9 MLT and a minimum at 21 MLT. I want to emphasize that this is a ve very, very simple model, but it's the only one, the only global uh, model that is available out there for the time being at least. Uh, the second uh, electoral loss rate model we use is the strong diffusion everywhere loss rate. None of them um, depends on geomagnetic activity, so we have done six different runs, chain rate and strong diffusion rate everywhere, and some fractions of it to try to simulate different geomagnetic activity situation. Uh, however, for this talk, of course, I don't have the time. I'm going to be focusing only two runs using chain rate and the strong diffusion everywhere rate. Um, so, first of all, let's compare how the strong diffusion lifetimes um, uh, are with um, how the strong diffusion lifetimes compare with the Chen lifetimes. Um, here I'm plotting the, the lifetime in minutes, and this is radial distance right there. Um, uh, the solid lines are um, uh, the Chen lifetimes, and the dust lines are the strong diffusion ones, and different. Uh, colors represent different energy invariants. From red to blue, we go from higher to lower energies. Um, the first thing to notice is right there around geosynchronous, uh, the chain lifetime at dawn is smaller than the chain lifetime at dusk. And another uh, important thing to notice is that as we go, although in the plasma sheet the um, rates can be comparable, as we go in the inner magnetosphere, the chain lifetime is, becomes uh, much longer than the strong diffusion ones. Um, let's see how this will affect first the electron energy spectra in the magnetosphere. Here I'm showing statistical data again from Geotail and uh, Themis satellites. 
Uh, this is the run with the Chen rate, and this is the run with a strong diffusion rate. This is Don Meridian uh, plane. Um, and as you can see, there is this distinct population of uh, 20 to 200 uh, kV electrons, is the ring current electrons, that exists in the Chen rate uh, run, but it doesn't appear at all in the strong diffusion rate run. Now, this is important because this would be the seed population for radiation belts eventually. So it can be seen the chain rate run in the observations, knowing the strong diffusion. Therefore, we think that the chain rate, although it's a very simple model, is uh, much more realistic than strong diffusion one. Now, if we go at geosynchronous, um, the energy uh, for energies above uh, 10 kV, you can see that the, uh, the chain rates, for, for the chain uh, lifetimes, um, the, the fluxes are much larger here with the solid line versus the fluxes during the run using the strong diffusion coefficients. Okay, so we got the spectrum in magnetosphere. Let's see how it's going to be the precipitation in ionosphere having this distribution. Here I'm showing uh, electron, uh, precipitating electron energy fluxes at, uh, um, with the chain rate uh, uh, precipitation and the strong diffusion run. And also I'm showing DMSP uh, mean fluxes. These are, um, um, these are fluxes 15 uh, minutes before the substorm onset. Um, so one first thing to notice is that much stronger don dusk asymmetry uh, using the chain rate precipitation, uh, while in the strong diffusion we get this in enhanced peak uh, towards dusk, which is to be expected since the chain rate is MLT dependent, while the strong diffusion rate is not. And I just want to point out, I'm, I am using the same color bars for both for simulations and observations. Yes, we have some differences, but at least with the chain rate, we get the don't ask asymmetry uh, much better. I think the uh, comparison is quite good. So, okay, since we verified that probably the chain rate does a much better job and it's important to have MLT dependent uh, loss rates in the inner magnetosphere, Let's see how uh, this would affect uh, the conductivity eventually, and therefore the plasma sheet penetration into the ring current region. For this purpose, I'm doing a slightly different run. Again, 40 kilovolts uh, polar cap potential drop for five hours, but then I step increase the um, potential drop to 90 kilovolts, uh, just to simulate maybe a storm-like uh, convection so that we can see things more clearly. And these are, these are the results. Um, on the right, I'm showing uh, conductivity, uh, latitude versus MLT. Um, we are going from dusk to dawn. And um, this is for 20 minutes after the convection enhancement. And you can see that for latitudes above uh, 68 uh, degrees, um, the conductance under the, the strong um, diffusion is larger than uh, the conductance under the chain rate. Um, and also you see this uh, peak uh, right there at the dusk that doesn't exist here. However, as we go to lower latitudes, we see that the conductance decrease is much sharper uh, for the strong diffusion rate while in the chain rate, we do have some significant conductance in these latitudes. And this is because, remember, the electron population that contributes to the conductivity, when we are under the strong diffusion rate, gets rapidly lost inside six uh, Earth radii due to very short lifetimes there. Now, okay, we have the conductivity profile. Let's see how this would affect the electric field. Here I'm plotting the azimuthal component of electric field. Remember, this is the component that will push the plasma further earthward. Um, and with uh, blue is the chain rate, uh, red is the strong diffusion rate, and the dust lines is 10 minutes after the convection enhancement. Um, the solid lines are uh, 20 minutes under, uh, after the convection enhancement. So you can see 
that within uh, the same time, 10 minutes, the shielding of the convection electric field is much stronger during the strong um, uh, diffusion case, which is expected since we don't have any conductivities in that region. And now if we go back to magnetosphere at 5.5 RE, we see that the ion pressure for the chain rate where the electric field is stronger is actually larger than in the case with a strong diffusion rate. So in conclusion, um, we, we have run simulations use, uh, using different electron loss rates and we want to see why, how, what's gonna be the effect in actually the, the ring current. And we see that under the MLT dependent electron loss rates, we have, first of all, electron lifetimes that become significantly uh, longer uh, in the inner magnetosphere. Um, also, I cannot read my own. <laughs> Can I see? Okay. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, the electrons in the inner magnetosphere remain there for many hours or more, while under the strong diffusion uh, loss rate everywhere, they rapidly get lost. Uh, the simulated electron energy spectrums in the inner magnetosphere can quantitatively ac account for the tens to hundreds of kV ring current electrons observed by the Themis satellites. Uh, this high energy electron population remaining in the near Earth region produces substantial conductivity at lower latitudes, uh, causes convection of enhancement, less efficient shielding, deeper penetration of the ion plasma sheet into the inner magnetosphere, and also it's important that when we uh, compare our results with DMSP satellites, we get much better comparison. And hopefully Van Allen probes can shed more light uh, into this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martina. Any question for Martina? And I guess not. Okay. I guess Thank so. you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to our last presentation, I believe, Electric Fields and Waves Instrument on the RBSP spacecraft investigating the dynamic of the inner magnetosphere. And this is by John Wygant. And here he comes. Okay, I can almost read it. There, do you want to do, do this you yourself? To, yeah. do you or okay. she can do it either way, but this will be here. Why don't I get you to do it, and I'll, because I'm going to ask you to go forwards and backwards okay. several times. Okay. Yeah. okay, so I'd just like to say how happy I am to be here at this point in time. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. And if you can't hear me, well, someone please uh, 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 raise their hand or, or shout out at the back of the room. Uh, I'm John Wygan. I'm the principal investigator on the EFW instrument. And there is the, the group of people that uh, contributed to this instrument and to the, uh, and to the software effort and the operations afterward, uh, afterwards. And I'd particularly like to call out uh, and mention uh, John Bunnell, who led the team at Berkeley, who was responsible for developing much of the hardware, uh, the IDP union, unit and the, uh, and the deployment units uh, uh, for this instrument as well as uh, running the SOC. And then another major hardware contribution came from uh, LASP with uh, a team led by Bob Ergen who contributed a digital so uh, signal processing board. Um, and also I'd, uh, I'd like to also thank uh, members of the ECT team and the Emphasis team and, and the RBSP community at large for, 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 for the help they've uh, uh, they've given us, and in particular, some of the people there mentioned at the bottom who have actually contributed plots. Let's go to the next slide. Is that you? Are yes. you going to do it? For oh, we did it. Okay. So the objectives, uh, so this is the, an electric field instrument. It measures quasi-static electric fields from DC uh, in the survey mode up to about 32 samples per second. Um, and also it measures higher frequency waves. The requirements are up to about uh, uh, 250 hertz, but we have the capability to go to much higher frequency, and we'll talk about that just a little bit. Uh, the, the main point of measuring electric fields in uh, inter, intermagnetospheric uh, 
uh, mission like this is to understand the energization of particles, and in particular, we're interested in how it is particles are energized by the large-scale storm time electric fields, and here we're referring to the kind of ring current particles that, uh, that Lou Lanzarotti was talking about earlier, plus uh, their electron counterparts. Uh, we're interested in substorm injection events, and those produce powerful electric fields that can be responsible for energizing particles. Uh, radial diffusion by ULF waves uh, of a variety of different driving forces can be important. And then finally, uh, 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 transport and energization by extremely powerful interplanetary shocks that send magnetos uh, magnetosonic waves through the magnetosphere, and, and particles can surf on those. And, and get energies up to up to tens of MeV, uh, as documented by Cress. And then the final issue is, is that there are numerous wave modes that are small-scale waves that are often large amplitude that exist, uh, and these can scatter and uh, accelerate particles, and uh, we have the capability of measuring these through spectral data and also through our burst memory. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is an overall picture of the inner magnetosphere. I think many of you have seen it before. The orbit that we have right now is more like this than this one, which is out in the tail. So the apogee is near about seven magnetic local time, and almost all of the data that I'll be presenting uh, will be through an orbit that has its peak actually out here, uh, if my perspective is right, at seven magnetic local time. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is the instrument itself. It consists of four spin plane boom deployment units. Each of them is 50 meters long, so it's 100 meters tip to tip in the spin plane. And I, I can't even, there, I, is that, I can't, this perspective is so bizarre for me at this angle that I can't tell. And then we have spin axis measurements that nominally can go out to 14 meters tip to tip. Uh, at the ends of each of these uh, 50 meter booms is a sphere. And inside of the, uh, near the sphere, and we can't see it on this scale, is a preamplifier that drives the signal down the long cable, which goes into our, our unit uh, where we process it to produce our various uh, science products. And also we transfer a signal off to the emphasis instrument uh, over a frequency range between about 10 and 400 uh, kilohertz, which goes into their uh, wave activity. In addition, we, we, uh, and we, send, we send that data to them for, for process, processing in their spectral and burst data. So emphasis is kind of like the high frequency part of this thing. We're the low frequency part. And, and we have kind of like, we have uh, a, a little bit of a, a focus on larger amplitude waves. So the sensors are actively current biased by instrument command. So we've spent a good deal of the portion of commissioning and even a little bit afterwards trying to decide what the best bias values are that we should command up here to balance photo emission and the plasma thermal currents to make sure that our probes float near plasma potential and also produce a good electric field measurement. So I think we've been pretty successful in that. Uh, some of the science quantities are electric fields, which are the difference between probes, the addition of sensor quantities, which gives us a measure of the spacecraft potential, which is an indicator of thermal plasma density. And so we can see things like we can see this plasma pause uh, density profile quite nicely, and it seems to agree with what we've seen from the uh, upper hybrid line from, uh, from the emphasis instrument. They, they're tracking each other, at least looking at the survey data of the two instruments, really quite nicely. So we're very, we're very happy about that. Uh, as I said before, survey mode is 32 samples per second, and then we have a burst mode that's 512 samples per second. And then finally, we have an interferometric mode, which does timing between opposite boom pairs, and this samples in another memory at uh, 16,000 samples per second. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so these are the measurements that we made. I think I basically, uh, basically outlined most of these here. We have uh, basically two burst memories uh, that I'll talk about. We have uh, I'll be showing some output from our broadband filters, which are 13 frequency bins where we look at the peak and average values. And something that's a little bit different from previous spacecraft is how rapidly we sample those. We sample at eight samples per second. Previous spacecraft I've been on sampled them at one sample per minute or one sample per second. Here we're sampling at a very high cadence, and we can actually s detect with a fair amount of reliability, the modulational envelope of Whistler waves. And this is very valuable because we can find the peak values routinely in our survey data. And then we have spectral and cross-spectral products that I'll spend a little bit less time on. Let's go to the next slide. 
uh, two birth memories, one birth mem and here's the special thing about this birth memory. This burst memory right here, burst one, is 32 gigabytes of burst memory. That means that our nominal mode, we can fill this memory if we sample at 512 samples per second for six samples, we can, six, uh, six electric field probes and three search coil probes, then what we get is, is it takes about 20 days to fill up that memory. So we can, so what we can do is sample at higher rates, like if we sampled at about two kilohertz, it would fill it up in about four days. And the virtue of this, of, ha of being able to store this data for long periods of time, is after the fact, after we have gotten our survey data down for a specific mode, we can look at that survey data, we can find injection events, we can find interesting intervals of data, and we can go back and we can download the memory that's up on the spacecraft, download the contents of the memory on the spacecraft for those specific time intervals. So it can be a human being that's identifying the interesting physics as opposed to an automatic algorithm. That being said, we can also operate that off of just like peak detectors in our instrument. And down here, we have, we operate a very high time re resolution, 16,000 samples per second. Doesn't begin to compare to emphasis, but uh, but we can do interferometric timing using, using this particular memory. And this memory right here is run off of uh, peak detectors uh, autonomously. Let's, let's go to the next slide. So here's, this is, this is our kind of like, like, like the zeroth order slide, survey slide that we show. This is 24 hours worth of data, shown it at 10 degree perspective as seen by me right now, so I can hardly see it. But the first thing to notice here is, is that this is during a major geomagnetic storm that people have shown data for before repetitively during this. Harlan showed some data for this, and I think so did Lou. And what it is, it's the November 1 event. And the, and the cool thing about the November 1 event, just about to talk about someone else's data first, is they're the inner belts, if I'm pointing correctly. There's another inner belt. So those are two perigee passes. And you can see gradually there's the formation of MEV electrons in the outer belt over this one day period. So the first perigee passed just shows a faint evidence for an outer belt. And then here it's a faint evidence, but here it becomes very powerful and very powerful here. And, and so what we have down here is, is we have RBSPA and RBSPB, and before the, at the early phases of the storm and before really very much has happened, uh, what we have is, is we have an electric field measurement, which is not measuring a quiet time value, but measuring a small value of less than about a millivolt per meter. If we looked at a quiet time value, our, our, our resolution would be on a fraction of a millivolt per meter. So we have a little bit of pulsation going on here in these spacecraft. We go through perigee, where we have some inaccuracies on B cross B subtraction, which we're doing pretty good at this particular phase of the data analysis. We're going to we're going to beat that error down, and then we see these powerful waves that exist for hours and hours and hours. And if I had to say that one of the most one of the most uh, obvious and kind of things that catches your attention about this data set is is that when we see major geomagnetic storms during the growth phase, during the period when the interplanetary magnetic field is 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 negative we see very, very powerful waves that exceed 20 millivolts per meter. These are saturated up to 100 millivolts per meter on this particular scale. And we see them for hours and hours and hours. And one spacecraft will rotate out of, date out of position, rotate out of position at Apogee, and the other spacecraft will rotate, and we'll continue to see these waves. And so, so we're used to seeing 10 or 20 millivolt per meter waves in the outer magnetosphere in the tail during, during injection events, but we only see them for, for like five minutes or or as the injection event goes by. But here we're seeing them for hours and hours and hours. And as we go into this, we started to go into these waves here. You can hardly tell what the waves are in this picture, but as we look at them with finer resolution and, 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 and more carefully, we can see that a lot of these are at the, the boundary of the plasma sheet in some cases. Some of these are ULF waves. The wave power goes all the way up to the lower hybrid and, and Whistler bands. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, oh, and let me go back, let's go back. Just, I, I just wanna make one more point. Here's, here's a kind of a curious thing. Look at, look at where you, the region where the radiation belt is and take that right down to where you see the electric field. You'll notice that there's no electric field. This, what a disappointment. No electric field in the near enhancement near, this, near the outer radiation belts at the time when they're growing. 
So, so that's, that's something to think about. In a few seconds, I'll show you the first slide of simultaneously low-frequency electric field data, plus the Whistler waves in association with energetic particles in, in the MEV range. So for this particular pass, and it's just one pass, and we have a couple several, and it's at one particular local time, there really aren't very many intense waves. The waves are all at apogee, and, and they're sub-millivolt per meter or millivolt per meter in the vicinity of these rapidly growing radiation belts. So let's go to the next slide. Here's Whistler waves. So we measure Whistler waves too, and we focus on the largest amplitude Whistler waves. And so the purpose of this slide is to just show the Whistler waves. And, and what this is, is this is, this is a, a, a channel between 3.2 kilohertz, kilohertz and 6.4, 1.5 and 3.2. So these are various frequency channels where we detect uh, waves. And then we look at the largest amplitude Whistler wave over an eight second period, and these aren't on the same scale. This is up to 300 millivolts per meter, that's up to 750, that's up to 50, down here we're up to 10. So we can see that the most powerful waves in this system are up here in the Whistler waves. And the largest Whistler waves are on the order of 300 millivolts per meter peak to peak. So that would argue that you should seriously consider the possibility that these Whistler waves are doing serious damage to the, to the energetic particles. That is, is, they're causing strong scattering on very short time scales, going back to a, a scenarios of Omura and other people in which the waves nonlinearly trap the, the particles as the waves propagate along the field line and reach a resonance condition. That being said, it's hard to match resonance conditions for very long in a medium like this. And so, 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 so it will be very interesting to see when we look at high time resolution data from this and also from other, other activities that we plan like Barrel, whether we can do a one-to-one -one correlation between individual Whistler pulses and, and the high time resolution data that we see during these kind of time intervals. So there you see it, very powerful Whistler waves right down at the radiation belts. And we're seeing them for hours, and this is a capability that we've never had before. There are hundreds of Whistler waves in this, this thing. Here, let's go to the next slide. This is a specific burst. Okay, this is a 200 millivolt per meter Whistler wave. Okay, so we can, we can look at this with our, with, our, uh, with, our, with our burst data. Let's go to the next slide. This is a forest. This is a blow up on another day of the Whistler waves. Not quite as high amplitude before. This is about, I can't even read the scale from here. What is it? It's down here. This is 20. This is, this, is, this is a four hour period and there's just a blizzard of high amplitude Whistler waves that are being monitored here, hundreds of them. So, so these are the kind of things that we're going to look compared to the high time resolution mag ice data. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. That, the fact that we didn't see waves doesn't mean that we don't expect to see. This is a crest pass through low altitude, and it does show that when you, when you go through low, low altitude on some storms, you will see large amplitude waves at, at low altitude. So you can't close the case on the waves yet. Let's go to the next slide. This is data that was shown by Harland. It was also shown by, uh, by the HOPE speaker. It shows the numerous dropouts. And the reason why we're so interested in those is for two reasons. One is, is that when we look at our spacecraft charging that we measure from our instrument, we can see an envelope of spacecraft charging up to about 50 to 100 volts during the periods of intense fluxes. And then we see the, the rapid dropouts down to very, very low negative uh, 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 sensor minus spacecraft potentials that's characteristic of moving into the lobe. So we can do that. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to show you, let's go back for just one second, I, one more thing. Okay, I'm going to show you the back, this half of it right here, okay? Let's go. Maybe one more minute. Okay. So what we see is, is we see the charging here, okay? We see it anti-correlate very nicely with the magnetic field, which indicates that all of those particles that we saw before that are in the enhanced fluxes are in diamagnetic cavities. And the diamagnetic cavities are 50 nanotesla deep. So it's a very powerful diamagnetic cavity that's trapping these particles at the center of the plasma sheet. These are the waves that we see that are at the boundary of the plasma sheet. So the strongest waves during this period of time are at the boundary of the plasma sheet right here. And they're going up to, what's that scale up there? Someone tell me, 100 millivolts? 100 millivolts per meter down here at about 50. And you can see they more or less correlate with the boundary. Let's go to the next slide. This is a close-up of one of those. This is inside of the plasma sheet. This is inside of the kind of the lobe over here, and this is the interface right here. You can see that because the magnetic field magnitude rises. So this is a small diamagnetic cavity. And what we see is, is we see these fluctuations right here. 
they coincide with a field aligned current here at the edge. There's the edge of the diamagnetic cavity. Uh, but the field is very strong and stretched in the lobes and not quite so stretched here. Here it's like 200 nanotesla. That means the magnetic field configuration is almost disk-like. And here we see these little fluctuations in the, in the magnetic field that is perpendicular to this. And, and so what this is, is, and so what these are is these are electric fields. These are basically alphane waves that are propagating, and if you detrended this, you'd get a large amount of pointing flux towards the Earth that, would, what, that, would, that it would impact on the Earth. These waves right here are waves that are ion cyclotron waves and kinetic alphane waves that are, that are pretty high amplitude, 50 millivolts per meter. These can uh, strongly affect the, the plasma, at least that is the source population for the energetic particles, and so let's go to the next slide. Here's a little scenario. Here's the boundary of the plasma sheet. There's where the intense waves are. Here are particles bouncing back and forth that could be in cyclotron or bounce resonance or simply stochastically heated in a random walk fashion in between here. So, so we have these two layers. We have these layers of some of the most intense turbulence that lasts for the longest period of time in the magnetosphere right here. Let's go to the final slide. Oh, we do timing too. So everybody wants to do timing. And so we did do some timing. You can see that this is the signal for spacecraft potential. It leads on spacecraft B but from, uh, compared to spacecraft A by two to four minutes here. And, and since spacecraft B is anti-sunward of spacecraft A, that implies that these structures, these boundaries, are moving past the spacecraft at 25 to 50 kilometers per second towards the sun. And so if you wanted to try and understand uh, the causative nature of, of what's causing these boundary fluctuations, you have several possibilities in the absence of spacecraft timing. One could be that they're driven by the solar wind and, and that they start at the nose of the magnetosphere and propagate around. But that's clearly not happening because these waves are going in the opposite direction. Another possibility is, is that the waves are driven by the kink instability, which goes in the direction of diamagnetic drift. But that's not a possibility either because this is opposite the direction of diamagnetic drift. The third possibility is, is that it's associated with some kind of activity that's going on in the tail that's associated with plasma sheet expansion and contraction and that there are injection events that are being driven by this. That kind of scenario, a tail-like scenario. And I would say that the money is on that one right now. That's, so let's go to the very last one. That's the summary. Okay. okay. Thank you. Jeff. Have a good lunch. Thank you.